How do we understand the lives of women who lived in ancient times? Where do historians and scholars go for evidence when there's relatively little available in written records? In this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast, we'll speak with Dr. Katherine Gines Taylor, a Nibley postdoctoral fellow at the Maxwell Institute, and Dr. Mark Ellison, an associate professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University, to learn more about the lives of Christian women in antiquity, how to uncover or unearth the religious lives of women, and discuss how the material record or historical stuff reveals religious meaning and practice. The best way to support the Maxwell Institute podcast is to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you download your podcasts. We would also love for you to sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu.edu slash monthly mi news. Lastly, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Taylor's research, you should listen to episode 101 of the Maxwell Institute podcast, where she discusses Mary, the mother of Jesus. Catherine, Mark, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Now, this wonderful new volume that you two co-edited with Carolyn Osick began as a symposium sponsored by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU and included other conversation partners. Originally, it was entitled Material Culture and Women's Religious Experience in Antiquity and is soon to be published by Lexington Books, which is an academic press. And the first question that came to mind for me was, what is material culture? Material culture has a number of different definitions. So we can look to physical artifacts, some from archaeological records, some from the art historical record, and these things can be defined as visual images, symbols, realia that we find in everyday life. But also, we want to point out that material culture is also the way that these things function and act and are interacted with by individuals, by people throughout history. And, and of course, we have been fascinated with the way that they make meaning in antiquity. Yeah, so I'm trained as an American historian. And so I work a lot with texts, meaning like what something, what somebody wrote, or being able to interpret instructions that somebody gave to someone else. But Mark, material culture seems to encompass much more. Right. The population anciently that produced texts was just a small subset of the overall population. Relatively few people were literate and able to read or write. And, and then, of course, only a small amount of what was written becomes preserved and passed down to us. Whereas material culture artifacts, features, physical objects from the past reflect upon a larger proportion of the ancient population. And so uh, one of the projects we took up in this book was, okay, if we look at these things and study them, what can they reveal about more of the population than we might get from texts alone? I'm struck too that material culture, uh, especially in cultures, ancient or modern, where women aren't necessarily writing instructions or delivering important speeches for which we have records to go off of, that Maybe we can learn more about women and what they valued and what they did through material culture. I think that's exactly right. And we need to be careful about how we use objects toward that interpretation. But when you take on images that and objects that would have been commonplace, perhaps even within domestic households or settings in which women are acting as agents, you find that they are often imbued with meaning either overtly or or less overtly. And it takes a careful kind of looking and appreciating and really an examination of a whole social world within religious contexts to understand how they may have operated and made meaning. And I think that a lot of these objects can represent where texts either fail to represent or even change or distort representation of women in the past. So you often find that object used as primary source material can put into tension what is in the literary record. Sometimes it agrees, sometimes it, it disagrees, and to take time to carefully do some comparing and contrasting on that front is, is really important. When I was in my doctoral program is when I first became aware of Catherine and, and met her, and, and we became fast friends because we both share an interest in, in early Christian art. And we both were really taken by a statement made by a, an art historian named Thomas Matthews. He said, written sources so seldom preserve the reflections of women 
in the early Christian period, but perhaps what is lacking in literary sources has been made up in the visual sources. And that idea has always captivated both of us. And so a few years ago, when Catherine approached me with the idea for this conference and a volume of uh, selected papers from a conference with this exact idea in mind, I thought it was brilliant. Joey, you mentioned that the conference included participants from across campus, and that's true, but we also had a good representation of scholars from outside of BYU, just from across the country, and one from who joined us from, I want to say, England. In the final volume, uh, I think there's at least seven of the chapters that are authored by people who are not from BYU. And I really think that that embodies one of the elements of the Maxwell Institute's mission, which is to not only gather and nurture disciple scholars, but to bring us all into conversation with folks from other faith traditions or traditions of no faith at all, but knowing that we learn and grow as disciples in that capacity. In thinking about material culture, sometimes that can be a little bit of an abstract term. Are there examples of Latter-day Saint material culture produced by women that might be familiar to our listeners? I think we have a really wonderful and proximate house of material culture in Salt Lake City. The museum that is run by the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, we have an excellent collection of material culture, some strange, some more traditional. I love visiting that place with my children and looking at these hand-stitched quilts Take where, where blocks and scraps of the very finest materials that they had were included. And, and of course, more strange and non-traditional objects as well. You can tell that people kept and held objects for what they represented, what they meant. And even, I think, for the, the kind of holiness that was not only part of the object or represented by the object, but the, the kind of spiritual meaning that some of these objects held that moved deeply into the souls of the early saint. I'm also curious by antiquity. That seems like a term that can mean a whole lot of things. Mark, what do you mean when you all use the term antiquity? We use that term in a very broad sense. Our, our chapters cover a period of time from about the 13th century BC in ancient Egypt and Canaan, all the way down to about the 8th century AD. We're using that to cover about a 2000 year span. Uh, different people will periodize history in different ways. Uh, this encompasses antiquity and late antiquity. Thanks, that's very helpful. And that comes across in the 11 essays that are in the volume. and. As much as we would love to be able to focus on each individual essay, we're going to focus on each chapter that you wrote as individuals. And we're going to start with Catherine. And you write that during the late ancient period, a religious experience for women was historically tied to the materiality of the domus and the culture of the household. First, what's a domus? And second, what do you mean by household culture? The domus is simply the house. It is the home and the abode of a family. And the, the domus that I particularly take up in my chapter is one from Shaba Philippopolis in Syria, and it was a villa style domus. So this is a larger, probably more elite household that follows a traditional Roman style of architecture where you have a centralized atrium with rooms surrounding it. The Domus was home not only to kind of the nuclear family, but when we think of households, that really is expanded to include, you know, people who worked for the family, also household slaves, as well as clients that would have been part of a kind of patron-client relationship within Roman familial structures. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is that there's a man and woman, sort of a couple, that are sort of like the top of the umbrella, and everyone who relies on them for financial means or for employment or for through familial relationships, we might think of that as everyone who falls under that umbrella might be considered part of the domus. Is that correct? Part of the household, the domus is the structure specifically, so the, the architectural structure. Wonderful. And then that second question, what do you mean by household culture? 
the household and the home specifically would have been used for all kinds of ordinary quotidian kinds of activities that people would have engaged in within the antique world. But one of the things that I really try and focus on is that houses were also spaces used for rite and ritual and worship. Houses are not just used for traditional or orthodox worship, but actually there are a number of scholars who point to the fact that within the private spaces, you could find less orthodox rite and ritual happening. Within earliest Christianity, you find that there are multiple communities that see themselves doing the right thing. They see themselves as orthodox within their set of beliefs. And by the time the second century rolls around, we do find some censure uh, that is affecting some of these communities. And so one thing that I want to point out, at least in my chapter, is that there are diverse communities that convened in domestic spaces and that these gathering places helped form their unique Christian identity. And even private households could become the focus point or the locus of survival or initiation or even recruitment for and conversion for some of these earliest Christian communities and believers. Now, in this house in Shaba Philippopolis, you describe three mosaics found in this same house. Is it remarkable that there are three in the same house or is this fairly common? No, it's not common at all. So th we have three significant monumentally sized mosaics, and this is just what was kind of left existing during the excavation that happened in 1925. Mosaics are an imported, they are an imported art to this region. They are expensive. This house is certainly the abode of the elite. Yeah, just so you all know, we are also going to have an image of the home and of the mosaics, which you'll receive in the show notes for the episode of this podcast, which you can sign up for at mi.byu slash edu. But so even in this elite home, to have three seems pretty important. Yes, and the way that I read them from the archaeological report, as well as the way that they are structured and the kinds of gestures and movement that the figures in each of the mosaics demonstrate or represent, it seems that they are tied together in a narrative. They, they were meant to be read not just individually, but collectively. That's wonderful to think about it as sort of a, a triptych, I think is the art history term, the, the tripartite or three parts of telling the same narrative or story. And you also write that the figures in the mosaics are personifications of certain things. Could you define personification for us? Sure. Yeah, personification is, so you have an anthropomorphic figure, you have a male or female, but often personifications are female. And these figures take on particular attributes, or sometimes they are named by inscription. And so this figure is not an individual, it's not meant to be a portrait of someone, but it's representative of a place or an idea. Um, and it, they were often used, really widely used within the Greco-Roman world to signify very quickly an idea or a place. It gave meaning really quickly in this singular figure. Sometimes they have different attributes or different objects that they hold that are specific to to who they are, whether it be a, a place, for example, a personification of the River Jordan will sometimes have this vessel pouring out of water, or you have a personification more abstractly of an idea. For example, I talk about a personification of the idea of philosophy. She is figured as a woman and the inscription Philosophia is above her head. Catherine, I'm just curious, as you were talking about that, I was thinking of personifications that an American audience would, would recognize readily, like uh, Lady Liberty holding up her lamp, or Lady Justice who's blindfolded and has the scales, uh, these attributes. So would the viewers of your mosaics in antiquity have recognized these women in the same ways that we modern Americans would recognize these personifications? 
Yes. As a matter of fact, they were familiar with this kind of visual language. They understood the iconographic trope. They knew the different attributes. It was part of their literary culture. And when we get to late antiquity, some scholars have pointed to the fact that there may have been some loss of literary memory pertaining to personifications. And so in some instances, particularly where there aren't specific attributes, you will have inscriptions that, that help the viewer be able to still read the image where there may have been some loss of, of literary knowledge. And so it really becomes a language unto itself. Yeah, I think of the phrase, actually, those with eyes to see and ears to hear will recognize what's going on. And with your training as scholars, that's what you two are able to see is, or you try and do as much as you can is to get into the, the shoes, so to speak, the sandals, I guess, of those who would have encountered it. Catherine, in these three mosaics, they have iconography or images that aren't overtly Christian. It's not like there aren't images of Jesus or Mary Magdalene or the sacrament or Eucharist. How but that doesn't mean that they weren't religious. Could you talk about how sometimes icons or imagery both have religious meaning as well as maybe different meanings for some people? Yes, and, and I'm happy to use as example these three mosaics. So the first mosaic that I encountered and that really caught my attention in the first place was a triad, a trinity of female figures the central figure seated with a cloth of honor behind her, and she's flanked by two other female images, and they are all they all have inscriptions above their head. So the central figure is Eutechnia, which means blessed with children. And then on either side of her are two female figures, Dikaiosine and Philosophia. So Dikaiosine is righteous judgment. And philo philosophia is philosophy, of course. And it just piqued my curiosity to think, how did these women come together in this triad? And why would you put them together at all? And so one of the things I did was look to ancient texts to find where you have philosophy and righteous judgment conflated or brought together and I actually found multiple places where there is instructive nature, the instructive nature of righteous judgment and philosophy are connected to the bringing up of good children. And, and yet these were not just found within so-called pagan or Greco-Roman religious contexts. They were brought in the second century, the third century into play within specifically Christian context. So that kind of started my curiosity. And then to find that we come to the second iconographic panel, which includes a marriage procession for the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, where we find this demigoddess Thetis seated in much the same way as the Eutechnia figure, joined in the joining of right hands, the Iunctio Dextrarum, that is typical of Roman marriage, indicating Roman marriage or marriage scenes. And, and of course, you have this marriage attended by different Roman gods. You have those who would have traditionally represented the procession, the marriage procession by which the bride moves to the household of the groom. And yet here, the bride is exemplified and she is enthroned. She is the one who is this semi-divine and she's being joined to Peleus here. And of course, they are known most famously because their offspring is Achilles, the warrior hero, who is part human, part God, right? A very interesting resonance for people thinking about who Jesus is in early Christianity. And you have other attendants at this wedding bearing gifts, but gifts that were likely associated with the washing, anointing, dressing of the bride, Thetis. So, so you have that scene. And then finally, we have a large triclinium mosaic, which is eight by eight meters squared. And so that is a really monumental dining room mosaic that features a 
squared off space with an exterior border where you could put dining couches for those who are there participating in the meal. And in the center, you also have a square with a circle set inside of that square representing this junction of heaven and earth. Within the circle, you also have couples who surround a dining table. At the head of the table, you have the bride who is offering the cup to the groom, and it's set over a table with, with a loaf of bread that is divided in a similar way to, to bread that you see, for example, in Teopanis. Uh, it, so it, it is broken into sections, and you have various other symbols of xenia or hospitality that are attendant at this, this wedding feast, this nuptial banquet. So I love that you're describing these both in the Greco-Roman context. As you say, what some might think of as pagan, but scholars don't generally use that term, but also a Christian context. And we spoke before about how those with eyes to see would have recognized these as Christian objects. What are some of the ways in which someone who saw these might have recognized them as Christian? Well, we have to understand that there are a variety of Christianities that involved very specific initiation rites. And some of the material that I found, at least literary material, as well as inscriptions and epitaphs, indicate that Valentinian Christianity, as well as Thomas Christianity, they, there were rites and rituals involving a bridal chamber. And, and coming into that space was by initiation and by receiving of knowledge or gnosis. And so I looked carefully at both Valentinian texts and inscriptions, as well as places like the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Thomas, as well as secondary scholarship to kind of weave together a set of texts that explain or show really the way that you could read these narratively toward Christian initiation and coming into a place where you wouldn't necessarily be joined man and woman in a marriage in the traditional way that we think, but where you would come into a knowledge of who you were and almost a div your divine self. You came face to face with your divine potential, your divine angel, as the text would say. And that coming to a knowledge of your own divinity was part of coming into this body of Christians. Thanks for explaining that. I think that that makes a lot of sense. There are actually some Valentinian inscriptions that me mention specifically the bridal chamber and indicate that rites within that bridal chamber may have been metaphorically accomplished. There's a wonderful funerary inscription for a woman called Flavia Sof, and it was discovered in Rome along the Via Latina. And there's a, there's a scholar, Jeffrey Smith, who argues that the inscription refers to a woman for whom rites, even perhaps the, right, the rites of redemption had been performed. So I wanted to share that. It says, yearning for the fatherly light, my sister and wife, Sof, anointed in the baths of Christ with perfume and unfading, pure, you were eager to behold the divine countenances of the eternities, the great angel of the mighty council, the true son, processing into the bridal chamber and ascending into the fatherly chambers, undefiled, and there's a lacuna here, you were crowned. I love that the inscription clearly outlines a particular kind of procession and order for the ascension of the soul, that Soph was anointed with oil and perhaps even participated in the baptisms or the baths of Christ. It was intriguing to me to see some of these things symbolically represented in ways that, again, were not overtly Christian or necessarily pointing to it, but, but have very close visual reference. Uh, thanks again for sharing that. I think that this is something that Latter-day Saints can really find value in, in learning about these early Christians, is that they valued the same things that we value, and they participated in religious practice in the same way that we do as well. Mark, do you have anything that you liked in particular about Catherine's chapter? Oh, yeah. Uh, 
One of the things I admire about Catherine's research in general is that she's not content to just stay with maybe what has already been said or what is obvious on the surface with the examination of an artifact or an image, but uh, she has a wonderful habit of asking, is there more? Is there more that could be teased out here? And she's done just a wonderful job of that in this chapter, which I know she worked on for years. It's uh, one of our co-editors, uh, uh, Carolyn Osick, she uh, called Catherine's chapter a fascinating weaving together of many iconographic and textual strands that might otherwise seem unrelated. And Catherine did that. She was looking at these images and looking at what scholars had already said, but then asking, is there more going on here? Uh, what can the texts of Gnostic Christianity suggest about these images if they uh, were a part of early Gnostic Christian house church? And if there were women in that house, which there would have been in that household, how might they have interacted with these images? And so I think what Catherine's written is just really, really interesting to think about. There is not a lot known about the material culture of Gnostic Christianities. Now, Mark, your chapter examines images of Eve uh, of the book of Genesis. And before we begin on your analysis, I wanted to say I was blown away by how small some of these artifacts are. Does that still stick out to you at all? Or are you just used to the size of these images and artifacts by now? Yeah, well, two of the artifacts I looked at were really small. Uh, there was a little ceramic oil lamp that you could hold in the palm of your hand. Uh, it's that small that had a little image of, of Eve on it, just standing by herself, not with Adam. And, and so I was really intrigued by that. And there was another artifact I looked at that was the base of a glass dish called a gold glass medallion. It was just a circle of gold foil that was excised and sandwiched between two layers of glass. And this circle was maybe about the size of a softball. But then I also looked at some sarcophagi and some, some carved funerary panels that would have been much larger, about the size of a table maybe. Thank you. And in your analysis, you know that there are four characteristics of early Christian images of Adam and Eve, though, of course, you're focusing on Eve specifically. Uh, they're found in a variety of media, including paint, sarcophagi, funerary materials, jewelry, and ceramics. They're predominantly private commissions. Nearly all of them can be identified as belonging to domestic or private religion, and they're very diverse. And what sticks out to me from those four things of the, is that they are predominantly private missions. Why do you think that they're private commissions. They're not mass produced. Um, I think some of that might be the accidents of preservation. By private commissions, I meant things that individuals commissioned as paintings on their family tombs or as uh, personal objects, carved images on a stone coffin like a sarcophagus. Although there are some early images that also appear in ecclesial contexts like a, a baptistry in Syria. Um, and so that was made by a whole community rather than for an individual who was asking an artist to create this image for an object that they would own. For me, the interesting thing is um, that the fact that they are private commissions means that individual ordinary Christians were finding these images meaningful and they wanted objects that they were going to use in daily life or in a funerary context uh, to be decorated with these images of Eve and of Adam and Eve and other biblical figures. And so that suggests a little bit about their intentions, what was interesting to them, what was motivating to them. And, and so uh, art historians work very hard to subtly tease out what are the nuances of those intentions? Can we discern them and get at the actual people behind those? Because these are private commissions, as you note, this means something special to them. Are they images or artifacts that might not be seen as completely orthodox by the religious communities that they participate in? Or does it really just vary by the individual artifact? It, it might vary by the, by the individual artifact. Some of the images of Eve that I was most interested in that I chose to focus on in my chapter are ones where the imagery gets tweaked in some interesting ways to suggest some other ideas about Eve that aren't always articulated in the patristic literature of, of the male writers of early Christianity. And I was really interested in those because I found that these objects seem to have been made for or by women 
and they corresponded with some ideas that I found in a few early Christian texts that also seem to have been influenced by or written by women. I'm curious, how do these conceptions of Eve, these portrayals of Eve, how do they come and the ideas that are around them? So with these early images of Eve, as you know, they may or may not have aligned um, with contemporary Christian understandings. And there are many different ways of understanding Eve's place in, in Christianity today. How does Eve compare to what may, might be called a, a Roman Catholic or a Protestant or a Latter-day Saint notion of Eve? Is it more positive or negative or about the same? Well, many of the images of Adam and Eve from early Christianity focus on the idea of the fall uh, and original sin, although that phrase original sin comes to be really hammered out and defined by Augustine in the fifth century. And there were, uh, there were images of Adam and Eve around long before that. But th that was the predominant way that early Christians wrote about Adam and Eve was in terms of uh, them as the progenitors of humankind and uh, the ones who committed the first transgression and caused humanity to fall. And it, it was very often an essentially negative characterization. And what I was interested in is in these texts that I found that were written by or influenced by early Christian women, very often the depiction of Eve was a lot more positive and redemptive and a little more complex than a simple, you know, a negative characterization. Sometimes she is a model of piety. She's a model of prayer. She teaches her, her children uh, she has visionary experiences. She sees heaven. She sees the redemption of humankind. She's almost like a prophet, a prophetess in some texts. She's a beautiful creation of God in, in one of the texts, uh, a radiant creation that gives off light. In one text that I, I thought was really arresting, it describes, um, let's see, let me just read this. This is a, a very little known text called Irenaeus Fragment 14. It's not written by Irenaeus, but it dates to the second to third century. And uh, it says this, why did the serpent not attack the man rather than the woman? You say that he went after her because she was the weaker of the two. On the contrary, in the transgression of the commandment, she showed herself to be the stronger, truly the man's assistance, for she alone stood up to the serpent. She ate from the tree, but with resistance and dissent and after being dealt with perfidiously. But Adam partook of the fruit given by the woman without even beginning to make a fight, without a word of contradiction. The woman, moreover, can be excused. She wrestled with a demon and was thrown. The woman, finally, even when she did hear the command from Adam, must have felt she was being made little of, either because she had not been judged worthy to converse with God herself, or because she suspected that there was even a chance that Adam had given her the command on his own. And so some early Christians were, and, and there may have been a group of women uh, that were uh, uh, behind this particular text, we don't know for sure, but some early Christians were thinking, hey, let's think about Eve in some different ways. Are there some positive ways we can think about her? And so I, I knew about these texts. And then as I looked at images of Eve on some objects, and saw that very often she was depicted in some very interesting, positive, redemptive ways, not with emphasis on sin or shame, with like, for example, head looking down, turning away from Adam in shame, but being redeemed by Christ or with Christ putting his hand on her shoulder and talking with her or laying a hand on her head to bless her. I thought, this is fascinating. And how would these images have looked to early Christian women? Are they asking for images like this to be created because they've been telling stories like the ones that, that we find in some of these texts? So I, I was very interested in that being a Latter-day Saint where we have a tradition of questioning, uh, ending upon the narrative we've received in Genesis and thinking of Eve in more positive and redemptive ways. I was fascinated by the similarities. I didn't go out looking to try to prove Latter-day Saint positions true, but I did bring to this subject my own interests uh, as a Latter-day Saint. Yeah, one of the images that you examine closely is an image of Eve found on a fourth century oil lamp that you described earlier. The woman is portrayed as nude, covering herself with her hands and averting her eyes while turning away. What does that reflect about what early Christians may have believed about Eve? Well, when early Christians began to depict images of Eve, they drew on visual vocabulary that was already in their environment. 
And for centuries, there had been ways of depicting a woman who, who is unclothed and is covering herself. And, and art historians debate whether that depicts shame or modesty, a virtue of modesty. But this is the image of Venus Pudica. And the early images of Eve were modeled after this. And one of the things that's intriguing to me about Eve on this oil lamp is that while she's depicted in this way, she's also not cowering as much as many of the, the Venus images often depict Venus. Uh, and so whoever owned this oil lamp and saw this image would have seen Eve differing a little bit from the image in their visual environment. And also Eve is making a gesture that indicates speech. And in antiquity, speech is often gendered and coded as masculine. But in early Christianity, very often there are female figures depicted speaking, bearing witness of the Christian message. And there was this valorization in early Christian art of the speaking woman. And Eve was depicted in this way. And so one of the most interesting things is here we have an image of Eve on this oil lamp, a light-giving vessel. And we have early Christian texts like the, the poem of Proba depicting the newly created Eve radiating light and she's speaking. And we have early Christian texts talking about Eve teaching her children, bearing witness, speaking, praying. And so uh, it makes me wonder, uh, was this oil lamp owned by an early Christian woman? Did she see in this image of Eve a model of being a, a woman of testimony who speaks a message, who prays to God? Uh, and, and sometimes these answers are, are, or these questions are ultimately unanswerable, but I still think they're worth pursuing and exploring. And if we can find texts that support a possible reading there, then at least it lays out a possibility of what a, a woman in Christian North Africa in the fourth century might have seen on her oil. Thank you for that. I think that it's also worth pointing out uh, the humility that scholars have to have in saying maybe, or one can imagine and things in that way. So even as art historians, as every listener will know, folks who look at the same piece of art won't see the same things or find value in the same things. And I think that you two both model in your chapters, this is a reading backed up by evidence, but by no means claiming that other readings could be incorrect in that way. One other piece of art that you describe, Mark, is a sarcophagus from Arles dating to 325 CE. It shows Mary holding the Christ child as the three magi approach, uh, Christ blessing a woman, and two scenes depicting Eve being ministered to by a pre-mortal Christ logos. There's also an image of Adam and Eve on the lid with a figure resting his hands on their shoulders after they've partaken of the fruit. What do you think of when you see these sculptures on the sarcophagi? I love this piece. And, and I know Catherine's very familiar with it because Catherine has studied the early Christian art of Arl and is quickly becoming a world expert on early Christian art in, in Southern Gaul. And so Catherine, feel free to chime in here uh, as, as I talk about this. But yeah, that uh, image on the lid shows Adam and Eve at the tree as they're partaking of the fruit. Uh, but at the same time, it shows an image of Christ behind uh, both Adam and Eve. So there's two depictions of Christ, two separate scenes depicted simultaneously. And in each scene, Christ lays his hand on the shoulder of either Adam or Eve and is teaching them, talking to them. And Adam and Eve look back and look eye to eye with Christ and he stands on their level with them. And I think that's, uh, that's just a really beautiful image. And it resonates with that Irenaeus fragment 14 that I, I read a little bit from before where the woman is judged worthy to converse with God herself. She receives divine instruction one-on-one -on -one personally. She has her own relationship with Christ. And meanwhile, simultaneously, the man has his own relationship with Christ. And one of the beautiful things about this image is that directly beneath it, there's a larger image of a woman and a man who are the owners of the sarcophagus. And the woman is directly beneath Eve, and the man is directly beneath Adam. So the viewer would have been invited to see the owners of the sarcophagus, the ones who were buried in this tomb, in connection with the scene right above and would have been invited to think of them as, oh, these two were also saved by Christ. These two each had their own personal relationship with Christ 
and we're also a harmonious married couple. Catherine, as you've been listening to Mark, and I know that you've read his work as a co-editor of the volume, what's something that you found valuable from Mark's work uh, from this chapter or about his general approach to scholarship? I really love the expansive and very thoughtful and careful nature of Mark's work. I also love the aliveness, the liveliness and the the quickened quality of reading through his text. I, it's such a joy to, to read through his chapter here and in other places. With this particular piece of scholarship, I love that he has challenged some, some really deep-seated and long-held uh, boundaries, particularly around Eve, and that, that he has brought forward this notion of aspiring to be like Eve within the early Christian context. You know, so often we find Eve set in some kind of dichotomous foil against Mary and you know, I've worked on Mary quite a bit, and, and I have always been dismayed by those early patristic texts that set, that set them in contrast to each other and, and really take so much of their, their womanhood and their motherhood from both of those figures. And, and I appreciate how Mark has even challenged in his work here an ideological stance that would promote um, female virginity and asceticism above a more moderate piety that included a l very large, well, the predominantly large group of female devotees to Christianity, and that he has exemplified Eve as someone that they could look to in order to, I think, set themselves up with a with an agentic powerful female gaze and to assert their own ideas about her. I really love that passage that you read and that you focused on here Mark. I think it's exceptionally important. Um you know, in so many instances we find, you know, ascetic renunciation of traditional values and and I think we need to also orient ourselves academically and and within our scholarship to recognize the the matrona uh, within Eve the matrona within Mary wonderful a few final questions before we wrap up here on the Maxwell Institute podcast mark you mentioned how many students were present at the symposium and knowing how much students at BYU are able to participate in their research process could you all speak to how working with students changed your work and what you were able to contribute to this volume? Oh, this was Catherine's genius idea from the beginning, is that we ought to have a place for students to be a part of this uh, conference as well. And the way it ended up working is that uh, the second day was devoted strictly to student presentations. And it was fabulous because they, they had worked on their papers with their professors. And Catherine and I both were helping to mentor students and get them ready uh, to do a, a, a really high quality job in their presentations. And then uh, they presented in front of this room full of world-class scholars and got feedback from some of the best of the best. And it was just a terrific experience for them. And many of the scholars went away very, very impressed with uh, the quality of BYU students. Blair Hodges uh, put a photo on uh, the Maxwell Institute's website or Facebook page, I don't remember, where he said, this is what raising up disciple scholars looks like. And it was just really, really exciting. And, and then we also had some advanced graduates students too, who presented on the first day and at least a couple of the papers that end up getting published in the volume are from some of these outstanding. One other thing that came to mind for me, and we've been talking about this throughout our entire conversation, but what do Latter-day Saints have to learn from the religious lives of women in antiquity? Women in antiquity, particularly early Christian women, have so many things to teach us. The, the variety of lives that they lived, at least those that we know from record, are very intriguing, but also the religious lives that we are trying to suss out from the material record demonstrates, at least to my mind and to my eyes, as I'm as I'm engaging with these artifacts in this material culture, a very lively, devoted group of women who who really 
keep Christianity alive and vibrant within the house, within their households. And I think that we, as Latter-day Saints today, can recognize in their voice, in their, in the way they show up in the world, in the way that they are even iconographically represented, that these women are agents of power. They are assertive. They have an authoritative stance to take. And we should appreciate the women within our own circles who also have those same capabilities, the same vibrancy of faith. And, and we need to listen to them and we need to look to their example and find communion and community in emulating faithful women even today. I love what you've said, Catherine, and I, I agree 100%. I've been so moved by the example of religious women in antiquity, whether it's in ancient Israel, early Judaism, broader Greco-Roman world, and certainly in early Christianity, which is where I love to study. been moved by their creativity, assertiveness, imagination. Elizabeth Clark says that for women and other subject populations, uh, they manage to find small openings for their own projects and expressions of value. And, and I, I love how, I don't know, just as, as a Latter-day Saint, we have the, this idea of turning our hearts to our fathers and our mothers, right? And uh, turning our hearts to our, our spiritual ancestors of the past. And this project has really been an expression of that kind of aspiration to turn our hearts to look at the material they left behind and see what we can learn from them. Dr. and Covenants 128 says, we without them cannot be complete. And I feel like my own religious life is more complete by learning from my spiritual ancestors of antiquity, amazing, assertive, imaginative women who left behind material in the, the archaeological record. One of the things that most uh, stays with me is that as I studied Eve, and I've also studied other women that were inspiring to early Christian women, the Virgin Mary, Thecla, St. Agnes, others, one of the things that has remained with me is that there wasn't just one way to be an early Christian woman. And in our own Latter-day Saint discourse, we've had that affirmation too. There's not simply just one way to be a Latter-day Saint. There are many ways of life. The records of our spiritual ancestors of early Christianity are very affirming of that. And, uh, and so I think they might say to us, you, you follow the Lord, you follow the Spirit, you find your journey, your way of life. Anything that we left behind can help you with that. We'll be happy. One final question for each of you. In section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we're asked to learn out of the best books. Catherine, what are three of your best books? Oh, it is so hard to choose when I have favorite authors like Marina Warner and Ross Kramer and Avril Cameron and Elizabeth Schusler Friorenza, you know, that kind of speak to my discipline and the lives of, um, of women in antiquity. But if I had to kind of narrow things down, I would say one really important book in my academic learning and world was Peter Brown's The World of Late Antiquity. It defined a period in which, of course, the period in which I work, but it defined it in a new way. It wasn't just looking at the late ancient world as one of decline and fall, but one where there were some exceptional new beginnings and that Christianity played a, a big part in that. It marked the impact of the world that was that was evolving into the medieval realm, east, west, and the impact of Islam, etc. And it really helped solidify for me not only the liminal and transitory nature of this time period, but the exciting nature of, of the material present therein. And, and I immersed myself and have not regretted it. Another book that I really love, uh, well, actually set of books, and I have Elaine Pagels to thank for kind of opening my eyes, at least initially, into the world of Gnostic text. Of course, I've expanded uh, reading into David Brackey and understanding earliest Christianities, etc. But I, I have always loved her book, um, The Gnostic Gospels, but also her book on Revelations and uh, Beyond Belief, which takes up... Um, the Secret Gospel of Thomas. 
And then finally, I would like to, I'm reading a book right now, which I am enamored with. It's called Ravenna by Judith Heron. And it's, it's a biography of the city Ravenna in Italy during its heyday as an imperial center. And I love it so much because it's reminding me of a moment when I was a very important moment in my life when I visited Ravenna on a study abroad. I stood inside the church of San Vitale. I was enamored by the scintillating mosaics all around me that had significant, deep, and multi-layered iconographic meanings. And, and it was in that moment and visiting the other sites within that lovely little gem of a city that I determined to pursue graduate work in, in art history and to focus on the art of early Christianity and the Byzantine world. Thank you, Mark. Same question. I would say one, for any listeners who may be interested in learning more about early Christian art, I would say one of my favorite books that has really changed my life is Robin Jensen's book, Understanding Early Christian Art. It's about 21 years old now, but it still is a wonderful entree into the, the field of early Christian art and understanding and interpreting iconography that early Christians produced. When I was working on my master's degree and researching uh, for my thesis, I was working on uh, some early Christian art and just trying to find help. And when I finally discovered her book, I was so taken by it. I, found, I, I just thought this scholar understands the theological content of the art better than anyone I've read. And it was just thrilling to me how she integrated texts and art and ritual and could interpret the images so well. And I wanted to quote from the book in my thesis, but there was a sentence, the sentence I wanted to quote seemed to have a typo in it. So I emailed Robin Jensen and asked her, I thanked her for her book and asked her about that sentence. And she was so kind and responsive. And I had no idea that professors who were so esteemed were also very often so generous and warm. And she certainly was and encouraging of my research and helped me with the quotation I needed. Years later, when I had an opportunity to return to school to work on a doctoral degree, I thought the person I would most want to study with in the whole world is Robin M. Jensen at Vanderbilt University. And so I, I applied and the planets aligned and I got to, to be her doctoral student. And so I just think the world of her as a scholar and as a, a human being, and I recommend that book, Understanding Early Christian Art. Another one that has been really formative for me is uh, Kayam Potok's novel, The Chosen, and another one in the beginning that he wrote. His characters are just so fascinating as they navigate deep commitments to their religious lives while also making the adaptations to the modern world that they have to in their course of life. And I find my own story in those characters, even though my own religious tradition is, is, and, and situation is much different. It's just beautiful, beautiful writing. And then I think a third book that is, is one of my favorites is Barbara Brown Taylor's book, Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others. The idea of holy envy, of seeing beautiful, good, admirable things in other faith traditions uh, than one's own and actually letting that inspire you and make you a better adherent of your own faith tradition is something that goes back to Christopher Stendhal. And it's been inspiring to me for many years, but uh, Barbara Brown Taylor has re recently written this book that articulates that concept so well and tells about her own practice of that. I found that this idea of holy envy has enriched my own faith and my own experience as a believer, as a scholar. And I, I have noticed that Joseph Smith in his own concept of restoration practiced a kind of eclectic, eclecticism and, and believed that the restoration was a gathering up of all that was good and beautiful scattered throughout the world. That's been my own experience too, that learning about the good and beautiful in other faith traditions hasn't weakened me, it's enriched me, it's made me a better follower of Christ. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Mark, for coming on to the Maxwell Institute podcast. We hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you do us a favor and recommend this show to others? Review and rate the podcast in Apple Podcasts or other podcast providers or share 